Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. And folks still coming in. I hope today is October the 29th. <laughs> then I studied the right lesson. The title of our lesson this morning is, of course we're doing a series of lessons on the Bible and today's issues. The Bible and today's issues. And the title of our lesson this morning is, Pornography is Destructive. Pornography is destructive. How many would agree? Amen. Folks, our central truth is God demands sexual purity. God demands sexual purity. Folks, let's do as we normally do. Let's go to the Lord. Each and every one of us pray in our own way and ask the Lord to send His Spirit to lead us into truth this morning as we study His Word. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for the privilege, Lord, to be able to come into your house, to be able to study your word, Lord, to call upon your name and to worship you. Father, we just ask this morning if you'd send your spirit to lead us as we study your word. Lord, help us to hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against you. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen and amen. God demands sexual purity. Our key verse is Proverbs 4 and 23, and it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Our learning objectives this morning, st students will recognize the danger of pornography. Students will discern the various ways that Satan introduces people to pornography and will take steps to avoid being caught in the trap. And students will evaluate their lives and actively remove anything that could lead them into pornography. Introducing the study says, although the topic of today's lesson is rarely addressed in the church, and it is, and I guess because it's not, it's just not a very pleasant thing to do, is to address it. Right, sure. And it is a, it's a huge problem, and that's why it does need to be addressed. And it, when it's not addressed, and people can kind of uh, smooth things over and kind of look the other way and kind of turn their head and, uh, in other words, not meet it head on. But although the topic of today's lesson is rarely addressed in the church, we're not immune to the scourge of pornography sweeping our society. According to the accountability software company Covenant Eyes, 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women say that they watch pornography at least once a month. Folks, that's Christian men and women, not, not worldly that don't claim to be Christians. One in five youth pastors... And one in seven senior pastors use pornography on a regular basis. And 43% of pastors say they have struggled with pornography in the past. While we may not all agree on the criteria for determining what constitutes pornography, because that is another, that's another issue in the church today is as to what constitutes pornography. I'm going to tell you, folks, I don't care what you say, and you can call it mild pornography if you want to. But any time that you go maybe even and watch a movie where even partial nudity is depicted, is acted out. PG doesn't stand for pure and godly when you're going to the show house. I'll tell you right now. They say parental guidance. I, I'll just be real. I'm just going to tell you right now. Uh, if it's rated PG, my kids never got to walk, go see it. They, they did it without their daddy knowing. Even the rated G ones nowadays, you really have to watch them close in this woke culture that we're in today. 
they may not be very much talked about as far or shown and depicted as, as nudity and things of that nature, but they're getting to where now that they talk about unpure sexuality, even in some of the G-rated, even in some of the Disney uh, movies now, they have children that have two mommies or children that have two daddies. It's, it, it's permeating our culture. It is. I'm just going to have to say it. It is a lot worse than it was when I was a child. No doubt. There's no doubt about it. But while, my, while we may not all agree on the criteria for determining what constitutes pornography, these statistics indicate that the problem is alarmingly prevalent even in the church. When you hear people get on social media that are churches and in church leaders, and they get on and tell that they have been down to see the, latest, the last best rated R movie, the latest one, and talk about it like it's just, you know, well, it was a good movie and this happened and uh, what is that one? I don't even know for sure what it's rated, but everybody and their brother talked about going. It, it was the last one of that person that drove the fighter jet and all that. I can't even remember the name of it. Somebody, I'm sure, will know what I'm talking about. But even those, and to my, to my, as far as I'm concerned, I, I think that I'll say that the criteria for determining what constitutes pornography is even, even evident in these R-rated movies that a lot of people go and watch in this day and time. Sure, that's right. We don't need to have anything to do with it at all, do we? What seemingly innocent activities does Satan use to ensnare believers in pornography? What seemingly innocent activities does Satan use to ensnare believers in pornography? I, in this day and time, now, I don't know. I've never been. I've never, I've never been. <laughs> I've never been on one of them. But they tell me that, uh, and I may get on some. I mean, I may make some people mad at me right now. But they tell me that if you go on one of these. Uh, ocean cruises that there's a deck up there for topless that the women go topless so there could be a lot of ways that you could be introduced now this is I'm talking about ways that you could be introduced to pornography not only just movies just out in public look at how men and women dress today to share an old and you know I know that even the preachers of this uh, the old time preachers for sure catch a lot of flack for what they called preaching on the clothesline exactly and, 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 and I, it's men too not, I'm not going to lay this at just the feet of the women the men are, are doing the same thing whether they're, whether they're a man or a woman to, to, uh, to borrow a, a brankalism <laughs> I don't know. Why? What? I, just like Brother uh, Frankel said, and I heard him say one time when he's preaching, he said, I'm having to call folks brothers and sister nowadays that don't wear enough clothes to make a jackrabbit a pair of leggings. <laughs> folks, now we may not need to go full gear back on the clothesline, but I think it needs to be addressed a little bit every now and then. It's one of the things that leads into Pornography. Often people stumble into pornography addiction through accidentally viewing it online or by consuming media with sexualized themes. And that's what happens most of the time, consuming this media with sexualized themes. You better, if, if, you've, got the, if you've got Showtime and you've got, uh, what is that other one? Uh, home, HBO, Home Box Office. I remember it from Home Box Office when it first started coming out years ago. Well, it could also be HBO, Hell's Best Offer, yeah. But that's exactly what we're talking about, and this is how a lot of people get us in, introduced to this thing that we're talking about, is by consuming media with sexualized things. No one is immune to the temptation of pornography. No one. If you come across it, because uh, that, that is another thing. If you, if you don't have a real good filter on your computer, they disguise links and things to this nature that it will things can pop up 
uh, even on Facebook, people have been known. I'm talking about they have hijacked people's page, their account, they call it, and then send out links to pornography and things of that nature to people on this. And it is nothing but the enemy trying to get people hooked on it. The, the internet's, I, it's embarrassing to sit down and watch the television anymore with your children because of the advertisements. How in the world, why in the world would you use a woman in a string bikini to sell toothpaste? But folks, that's exactly what we're talking about, the sexualization of our media. And no one is immune to this temptation. Once it gets started, it takes root. So we must stay on alert and guard against Satan's attacks. The growing problem of Christians using pornography is morally devastating for two reasons. First, Christians using pornography defile themselves. They defile themselves. Disobeying God's desire for sexual purity. Second, its use among believers hinders the church's impact. Oh yes, it hinders the church's impact. In this lesson, we'll learn why pornography is so destructive, how it affects users, and what steps we can take to avoid and to overcome it. How, do, how would it affect your spouse? And the first thing we have to do is realize that sexual lust is serious business. We've kind of played it down and we've made it a little bit funny through the years at times. Don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly. Let's do it. We're going to begin reading Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. The Bible says, Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable, profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. People often fail to treat the sin of pornography seriously because they choose not to treat the sin of lust seriously. After all, lust is unseen and private, though the consequences can be all too public. Those who are caught up in lust can delude themselves by thinking, I'm not hurting anyone. Or, everybody looks. It's only natural. Everybody looks, just don't touch. That's one of the ones that goes around, isn't it? But the sin of lust connects the destructive activity of, persons, of a person's eyes to the condition of their heart. Now, I will have to admit and have to say that I, I've even discussed it before with other Christi Christians and with fellow Christians. You can, a man, even as a man, and I suppose as a woman, I can't speak for a woman, but I know as a man, you can look at a person, at a, a lady, and appreciate beauty. You can do that without sinning in your heart. I mean, some people dress nicer some people take better but the thing about it is and I heard one preacher say it, and by the way it was a Baptist preacher I heard him say that if how you dress talking about men or women if how you dress draws attention to your body then you're then you're doing it all wrong if it is a frame and draws attention to your face and your light countenance then that's the way that it should be I tell you, I, and I know I'm going to get on a little bit of a soapbox here, but some of the things that people wear, and it's men and women, I mean, some of these, uh, what do they call them, these yoga pants and stuff like that, especially the ones that have a word across the back end of it. What in the world is that there for? To totally draw your attention. But our culture 
Our culture compounds the problem of pornography. While other sins like greed, violence, and racism are often condemned. Oh, look around you, even in the world today, racism. They're calling everything racism. My goodness, you can't even, uh, I don't know, there's anything you seem, seemingly do, they'll call racism on you. Violence, greed, you know. But you don't hear them say anything about pornography and some of these other things. Lust is an advertising tool and entertainment standard. That's supposed. Either that or just to, I don't know, maybe they just don't want any man looking at their wife's hair. I don't, I mean, they take it to the extreme, no doubt. Right. They take it to an extreme. Yes, they do. They certainly do. But the thing about it is, until, it, until this changes, you know, we can't come out of the world. We're going to be a part of the world. What we have to learn to do, you know, lust is an advertising tool. The world uses. The, it, and there's no doubt about it. Just like Brother Cletus said a while ago, just look at the commercials on television. You can be watching a good show. As a matter of fact, you'd be watching Andy Griffith reruns. And then those, then those advertisements come on there. Because uh, lust is an advertising tool and an entertainment standard. Erotic imagery sells products and entices the eye in virtually every public place. The temptation to lust is ever-present. Society's approval makes it easier to justify. Scripture points us in the opposite direction, emphasizing God's knowledge of both outward and inward sins. God pointed out to Ezekiel the foolishness of thinking certain vices could remain unseen. And he said, Son of man, have you seen what the leaders of Israel are doing with their idols in, in dark rooms? They're saying the Lord doesn't see us. He has deserted our land. Folks, our choices are never hidden from Him. No matter what you're doing, you think nobody knows about it. God knows. As a matter of fact, the only one that really matters knows. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made it clear that God abhors lust specifically. Matthew 5 and 27 through 30, which we just read, the measures that Jesus mentions to avoid sin cutting off offensive hands or gouging out offensive eyes may seem drastic. I've heard it described as hyperbole. I'm going to be real honest with you. I don't think it was totally hyperbole. I don't think Jesus was doing a bunch of it exaggerating because I promise you it would be better for you to lose a physical hand or, a fi or the sight of one of your physical eyes than have it to offend you and you go to hell and spend eternity in hell. It may seem drastic, even shocking, but they clearly illustrate the gravity of his teaching. What it should let us know is how important what he was teaching. As a matter of fact, let's read verse 28 again. It says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his what? Heart. So therefore, it really not going to do you much good to gouge your eyes out. Why? Because blind men can lust. Men who can no longer see can lust. A one-armed man can still steal. Folks, it's your heart. It's the condition of your heart if you're doing these things. Lust is as serious as other sins. Believers should do whatever is necessary to avoid and to overcome it. At its essence, sexual lust is envy. That is what it is. It is envy. It's wanting something that, you, that God has said you cannot have. While sexual desire between marriage partners is normal and ordained by God, lust involves coveting a person completely outside the bounds of what God has given you. It starts out looking over and thinking the grass is greener over on the other side of the fence when it ain't. 
That makes the sin of pornography all the more serious because it personalizes the sin of lust. Usually relegated to the mind by using the faces and the bodies of real people, each of whom is made in God's image, pornography is commercialized, fantasy, exploiting participants and viewers alike. In what ways do you avoid materials in your home that could incite lust? The best thing to do is take that dish off the side of your house and pitch that thing in the trash if you can't stay off the channel that you don't need to be on. And not to even mention, not to even mention what you can do with these telephones now. Satan's making it mighty easy. He's making it mighty easy to, to, to get. What additional measures might be necessary? Sure. Prayer and getting in the Word of God. But we also might have to remove some of these things from our home. Should church leaders be talking to young people about pornography or should, the res or should the responsibility of addressing this issue be left up to parents? I think both myself. I know the parents should be addressing it. And you know what? Church leaders can address it without getting too much in detail. They certainly can. You know, and teach them even how they present themselves. Not of this world. Let's go to First John. Chapter two. First John, chapter two. We're going to read verses fifteen and sixteen. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And you know, about every sin, I guess every sin can be classified as one of these three. The lust of the flesh, which another way to put it would be evil cravings. Craving something that you know is evil, that's not right. The lust of the eyes, that's craving what you see. And let's not forget about the pride of life. I think it should be mentioned here also because it's part of it. The pride of life trusts its own power trust its own abilities trust its own uh, ability to get what it needs rather than trust in God trust its own power and not divine laws and when I say divine laws I talk, I'm talking about things like sowing and reaping things of that nature but the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes are products of loving the world more than God. They embrace a moment of desire without the connection that God intended for sexual relations between husband and wife. There's no intimacy in pornography. Just an intense experience in which a user connects with no one, communicates with no one, and grows in a relationship with no one. As we discussed in last week's lesson, God designed people with an inherent need for companionship. It is not good that the man should be alone. In response to that human need, God created a heterosexual covenant partnership that included permanence and faithfulness. Husbands and wives are instructed to meet each other's sexual needs in 1 Corinthians, which were created and celebrated by God. God has always called his people to be holy or set apart from the ways of the world. He is a God of covenant faithfulness. 
And we are to be set apart of the world. How would you describe the world? It's not talking about the earth, is it? I think the word also says that uh, we know who the prince of this world is, don't we? It's Satan. Now, we know that God is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's Lord over everything. But as far as, and that's why we have to make this distinction here. The world is actually what you would call the ordered system of which Satan is the head and not God. There is a structured system in our country, in our society, in our world. There is a structured system that actually Satan is the head of and not God. And we call that the world or worldliness. God has always called his people to be holy or set apart from the ways of the world. He requires the same of us. Pornography thwarts, thwarts God's design and it appeals to the lust of the flesh. Circumventing sec sexual purity and replacing it with a momentary hyper-stimulating experience. People use pornography in an attempt to meet their desire for physical intimacy without committing themselves to a marriage covenant. In that sense, pornography not only gratifies sexual lust, but it also caters to human selfishness and fits the unholy circle that John described as the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. I think the way Grandma and Grandpa described it when they were warning me against such was, you know, and especially to the young ladies was, why would somebody want to buy the cow if they're getting the milk for nothing? How many's heard that one? <laughs> sure. That's why you got to make sure. I mean, it takes both sides, doesn't it? Pornography caters to the mindset that it's all about me, what I want. That way I don't have to worry about and, 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 and wonder and, and mess with the, the thought of whether I am doing my part for my partner and for my husband or my wife. If I'm staying faithful to them and I'm staying true to them, I don't have to worry about all that. I can, all, I can just be faithful and true to myself. And that's what Satan entices with. Self. It's all about me. This kind of self-centeredness limits a person's ability to create a deep bond with someone else and sustain it in a marriage relationship. Why? Because, well, if things don't go my way, pitch it. I'll just leave them and I'll find me somebody else. That's the most selfish thing. The, world's, the world peddles in lust and pride offering temporary and meaningless pleasures in return. But God's sober reminder is to seek His will and His kingdom first. And you know what? If you're seeking His will and His kingdom first, then actually your spouse is never going to have to worry about having to leave you because you're going to be, worried, you're going to be uh, caring about their happiness and you're going to be caring about their needs rather than just only your own. Because, folks, it takes two. You are not controlled by your, you know, this is what you shouldn't be. You're not controlled by your sinful nature, and you do not belong to this world. It's what God would tell his children. What effect do you think the widespread use of pornography might be having on people of all ages? What do you think this widespread use of it might be having, the effect that it might be having? Sure it does. It damages, uh, yeah, your testimony. <laughs> you know, uh, it's it and it's it. What effect that it has is it it just cultivates more self-centeredness. Before long, you're just completely consumed with self, and you don't even acknowledge God. You don't acknowledge others. Everything, and and you know that's why a lot of people use people. They don't love people. They use people to get what they want. And without God's love in your heart, that's the way, that's, that's, you know, 
you're going to be serving one of two masters. If you're not serving God, you're going to be serving the enemy. Do you think a person can become addicted to pornography? <laughs> yes. Why? Because of the enticement. Because it is it, it, everything. It's it's a so, selfish fulfillment of 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 an evil desire, of a lust. And when those, when that's that's a person can become addicted to anything like that. Why do you think people become addicted to illicit drugs? It makes them feel good. That's why we call illicit drugs, illicit sex, a lot of what it's talking about. But when it comes down to it, folks, it is. It's a heart issue. It's not your eyes, not what's defiling you. Matter of fact, didn't Jesus say it's not what goes in at the mouth that defiles a person, is it? It's what comes out of his heart that defiles a person. Let's go over to James. James chapter 1, we're going to read verses 13 and 13 through 15. The Bible says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And folks, the reason, the reason we're reading this is because have you not heard people say, Well, now God put that sexual desire in a person. You know, so, I mean, that's not bad. Let's read it on. It says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The world may strategize ways to draw people into pornography. But each individual decides whether they will yield to temptation. Avoiding the snare of pornography is every believer's responsibility. Jesus asserted that temptation never comes from God, but it comes from our own desires, which give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. The tempting path to pornography follows a pattern as well arousal, consideration, and indulgence. The immediate result of giving in to the temptation is mental and spiritual defilement. One of the many long-term consequences is the person's heart becomes increasingly less receptive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The longer you do your own thing and not worry about what God or anybody else has to say, the longer you do that, the more calloused you become and the less you even hear God or hear from God because your mind becomes totally self-centered totally consumed by self a person who is tempted to view pornography may be looking for a distraction from life's hardships or a temporary rush to numb a deeper pain the thrill of looking at er erotic imagery sends powerful chemicals to the brain creating lasting neural pathways that, ca that can affect future behavior it's almost as if the pornography were saying, when you need to feel good or be distracted, I'm here for you. The craving to repeat that experience is what it means to be drawn away of his or her own lust and enticed. Can't blame it on anybody else. When you are drawn away to sin, you're drawn away by your own lust and enticed. That's when a decision is made. I will yield or I will not yield. Before giving in to temptation, there is a moment when a Christian must say, I know that this is wrong. I know it hurts the heart of God, but I give my myself permission to do it anyway. I'm going to go ahead and do it. And the thing you've got to be real careful about is when, you, when God convicts you of doing that and you're sitting there thinking this thing, I know it's wrong. I know it hurts the heart of God but he'll forgive me. Now that's called sinning presumptuously. 
Let me tell you something. When you start into that, you're starting into a whole different thing. You know, God has a little bit more, uh, I think, compassion on a person who has been deceived and led astray by the enemy. But when you, when he warns you ahead of time and you go right ahead and you say, well, I know it's wrong and I know I shouldn't do it, but God will forgive me. That's when you're treading on dangerous territory. If God convicts you of something, you better turn around. You better do like the word of God says and you better flee. That means you better run. That don't mean walk off, walk away. It means run. Our evil desires then give birth to sinful actions leading eventually to death. This, in, this could include, and think about this, it may not be talking about, which eventually it does, sin does eventually lead to death. But this is also could include the death of a marriage, the death of a ministry. Don't think it won't, can't happen. Many's a preacher and pastor that have a, had of a ministry and allow this thing to just get in their heart and grow and grow until it could also mean the death of a career and it can certainly mean the death of a reputation I mean don't get me wrong how you can live for the Lord for 60 years and have a good reputation and one slip up can ruin that reputation. And it, and it take years to build people's trust back up in you. It could cause the death of a person's conscience. The hardening of the heart eventually result in condemnation and spiritual death. Even a Christian that, that gets caught up in a lot of this, these things sometimes and it comes to light. They can react in one of two ways. They can either let it convict them and let it lead them back to God and repentance and back to God or the opposite. They can become hardened, become angry at God and people around them and eventually result in condemnation and spiritual death. Each time a person yields to temptation, the heart is hardened all the more toward God, toward loved ones, toward fellow believers. Saying, I'll do what I want, makes our conscience more calloused toward the Spirit of God and the truth of His Word. Before long, rebellion grows in other areas of life since a little yeast always spreads through the whole batch of dough. As Paul said, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Where pornography is allowed, compromise, carnality, and a lukewarm attitude will surely follow. Have you ever had difficulty breaking a habit? How did you overcome the problem? What worked and what didn't? This is what you need to be thinking about when you get into some of these things. And as Brother Brian's already mentioned, prayer and the Word will, will help you more than anything. Why do you think a believer who has become a new person or a new creature will experience old temptations? He's going to work on you harder even, isn't he? You, and, and the thing about it is, you're still, even though you're a new creature in Christ, you've started over the clean slate, justified, never sinned. When God forgives you, you've been justified. The best way I know of uh, defining that is, is you're, you become justified, never sin. Even so, you still have a sin nature. There is a sin nature that remains. And if you don't put your faith and your trust in God, listen, we cannot, we can't live, I'm sorry, to let you in on this secret. You can't live a Christian life. You, you, or you cannot live a Christian life can't do it you say oh my goodness you mean I quit dipping snuff for this <laughs> let me tell you something folks it's only your faith in God 
that will help you live a Christian life. As long as you have faith in him and what he did for you at the cross, you can have that Christian life. Do Christians ever reach to the point of being immune to temptation? <laughs> no. No, they do not. Ever. Now, there are a lot of temptations that the devil ain't going to mess with no more. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I can almost guarantee you the devil ain't going to mess with coming to me and tempting me to go down here to the beer joint and get drunk. Because he... If he don't know, he ought to know. It ain't going to do him no good to tempt me to do that. How glorious of a life is that? As I remember one preacher used to say, to, come, to, to go out and stay out half the night and then come home and make love to your toilet. Just hug it. Folks, that's how glorious it is when it comes right down to it. <laughs> that's what it leads to. <laughs> Think about it. How wonderful of a time you had last night. He ain't going to try to tempt me with that. But I'll guarantee you there he's going to find something. He's going to know your weakness and he's going to find that and that's what he's going to tempt you with. Broken hearts. Let's go to 2 Samuel. Second Samuel eleven. We're going to read verses two through five. It says, And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliel, the wife of Urias the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. See, what David should have done as soon as he went out on the roof of the king's house and he saw that, he should have made an about face and he should have ran back into the house. But he didn't do it. Now, what Bathsheba was doing bathing where she was visible from the roof of the king's house, I don't know. Uh, she might have been, she might should have been paying a little closer attention to where this was taking place also and also when she was bidden she came and went of course he was the king so she she had to she was I mean and what he did he used his position to commit a sin is what he did let's go over to chapter 12 2nd Samuel chapter 12 And the first 13 verses says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat, or his own food, and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. I mean, it was like one of the family, this little lamb was. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock, and his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming to him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. See the custom in those days if a stranger or a traveler come through to your house you were to feed them and wash their feet and take care of them and feed them but 
this, what this rich man did rather than taking one of his little ewe lambs. He took the poor man. He just had one. The rich man had no telling how many. For the poor man that was come to him, in verse 5, and when Nathan told him that, in verse 5 says, And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. If that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such, thing, such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. And you know, remember the rest of the story when Bathsheba had told him that she was with child. Then he called Uriah in and he tried to get Uriah to stay at home for a night or two. But Uriah had too much honor. He wouldn't do it. He said, not with my fellow soldiers, my federal fe fellow countrymen in, at the war. I'm not going to do it. So he wouldn't go in and to his wife. He slept out on the porch. He said, I can't go in there and do that with my other fellow men at war. So since that didn't work, what did David do? Remember, he sent him to the front lines so that he'd be killed. That's why it says here in verse 9, To do evil in his sight, thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. And you know what? That Since that sword never departed his house was the reason that he was not even allowed to build the temple. He gathered the stuff, but his son was the one that built it, wasn't he? In verse 11, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will rise up, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before the thy eyes and give them unto thy neighbor and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son for thou didst it secretly but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son and David said unto Nathan I have sinned against the Lord and Nathan said unto David the Lord also hath put away thy sin thou shalt not die but I want to go ahead and read verse 14 because it says, Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So this is like Brother Brian talked about a while ago. It brings reproach upon the church when these things happen too. Because just like verse 14, it says, Howbeit, how Nathan told David. He said, Howbeit, because... By this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Some may claim pornography is a victimless sin that doesn't affect anyone else. Nothing could be further from the truth. The lust behind pornography use is the same driving force that leads to any sexual sin. Not only does lust harm an individual's purity, but is often a gateway for further sexual activity that is destructive for others. These people and these young people, if they don't have any of the Holy Spirit or any of the upbringing or the groundwork set for their lives and the direction of their lives and their hearts, they just get deeper and they get deeper into this and deeper and it takes more to... to to satisfy that urge that they have and it takes more and more and the next thing you know they're one of these 20 or 30 year old young men that's going to prison for child pornography that's how it happens as that lust is fulfilled and they keep going God described David as a man after his own heart how can you explain why a godly man would behave in such a, an ungodly way. Folks, it's because of that, what we were talking about a while ago, that sin 
nature that remains in us. We'll go on. We're going to try to get through this. Let's go to Job. Job 31. Job 31, we'll read the first eight verses. It says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? For what portion of God is there from above, and what inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? If I have walked with vanity or if my foot hath hasted to deceit, let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know mine integrity. If my step hath turned out of the way and mine heart walked after mine eyes, and if any blot hath cleaved to my hands then let me sow and let another eat yea let my offspring be rooted out if mine actually that verse 8 as far as we're reading this is following Jesus staying alert and ready for any attack of the enemy may launch against us in many cases guarding our eyes is the first line of defense what Job said I made a covenant with my eyes why then should I think upon a maid? Why should I go looking at a young lady in a way that I shouldn't? Job's covenant with his eyes not to look with lust at a young woman is crucial for each of us to make. The lethal repercussions of lust all begin with a simple look. David looked at Bathsheba, and because he kept looking, a child died and an innocent man was murdered. As Jesus taught, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. So what should a person do to break the habit of viewing pornography? First and foremost, confess the sin to God. That is the first and foremost thing you have to do. I mean, we have to admit that it's wrong. We have to confess it to God. Praying like David for both forgiveness and cleansing. But since pornography is highly addictive, rarely can one overcome it alone. The seriousness of the issue calls for confession to another person. Separation through blocking software or other means. Ongoing personal accountability. Commitment to regular fellowship spiritual disciplines and godly counsel from a pastor or a Christian mentor with time diligent and Holy Spirit's help a person can learn to manage temptation when it happens folks we're about out of time but I promise you a lot of these are good tools if you have a computer in your house and you also have children you need some type of a filter on it and they have some good ones uh, the one that we actually don't use anymore we don't have young people at the house anymore but uh, American Family Association has a good one. If you have children or grandchildren or, uh, that you're letting use your computers without your supervision, the best way is just have be right there. Not, don't even let them on it unless you're there with them. But following that, that I'll, I can vouch for the American Family Association. I mean, you can't. That, it is a good filter. It will not allow any type of I'm talking about uh, not only will it stop pornography, it'll stop uh, profanity, any of the, anything like that. I mean, it, it just, it'll just filter it out. It won't bring it up. And if you try to, if, if somebody s even sends you a link, maybe in an email or something like that, you click on it, it'll just, it'll just come up a bunch of X's. But that, you know, is what may have to take place. Why do you think humans are so easily ensnared by what we see? What practical steps do you take to battle this tendency? Well, of course, prayer. Confess to Jesus if you have problems in that area. Ask him to help you. Folks, he's faithful. He will help you. Have you ever asked someone to hold you accountable as you were trying to overcome a deeply ingrained habit or addiction? 
what was the result? It helps. We're out of time. It does help. So that's another thing you can do.